guys, today we are going to talk about the organization of the periodic table. So this is the first uh, lecture, first part of the notes, organizing the periodic table. Make sure you're taking good notes. There's going to be a quiz at the end. All right, so the question is, why is the periodic table important to you? It's really a, the most useful tool we have in a chemistry class or as a chemist. You'll use it on every test. It organizes lots of information about all the known elements. This is stuff you don't have to write down right now. Pre-periodic table chemistry was a huge mess. You still don't have to write this down, okay? There was no organization of the elements. Everything was all over the place. It's like going into the grocery store with no organization. You find some cheese beside the um, celery, and beside that is some hamburger, okay? So there was no way to organize all of these elements that had been found, and therefore it was really hard to find um, any relationships between them. So chemistry really didn't make a lot of sense before. Now you're going to have some a couple things to write down. You don't need to know the year um, or that he was a Russian, but Dmitry Mendeleev was the guy who came up with the first periodic table. He found a way to start organizing these elements. This is important. He organized these elements by atomic mass. Okay, so you need to know that Dmitry Mendeleev organized elements by increasing atomic mass and that he was the first one to come up with a periodic table. He put elements with similar properties together. You don't really have to write that down. You have to remember that it's by atomic mass with Mendeleev, but it's important to know his history or why he did it this way. So he found, um, you know, like he might find a couple of elements that were very hard and metallic, and he would put those together on the periodic table. This helped him to start predicting some um, properties of undiscovered elements. He could say, hey, you know, we've got some of these. There's probably some others out there with these same properties. There were some problems with his periodic table, though. It didn't quite fit together um, perfectly. So along came, in 1913, a guy named Henry Mosley. And Henry Mosley decided that he would organize the elements instead of increasing atomic mass, he used increasing atomic number. So he used that and figured out that that's the same, or he used the number of protons to do increasing atomic number. And when he did this, so many patterns emerged on the periodic table. Um, it took care of all, most, all of the discrepancies in Mendeleev's arrangement. And it's the modern periodic table. It's what we use now by Mr. Henry Mosley. You do not need to write this down, but an interesting fact, he was only 27 years old when he came up with this periodic table. He was um, most likely going to get the Nobel Prize in Physics at 27, 28 years old, but he went into uh, the British Army and was shot and killed in a battle called the Battle of Gallipoli. So just an interesting little tidbit. Imagine being 27 and developing an entire periodic table. It's pretty impressive. All right, so let's talk about how elements are arranged. Very, very important, oops, that's ugly. Um, very important is the word periodicity. You need to know this word. It's the same as periodic law, okay? What that means boiled down is that there are patterns on the periodic table, okay? There are patterns of properties, um, with increasing atomic uh, number and both chemical and physical properties vary in a periodic way. So really, again, it kind of just means patterns. So periodicity, periodic law, okay? And we're gonna be talking about some of those patterns. The periodic table is actually, I mean, I'm a nerd, I guess, but it's one of the coolest things when you really think about how all of these patterns emerge when you arrange it this certain way. Like, it's really cool. So we're gonna learn some of those. Um, first, the periodic table, let's talk about how it's uh, split up into groups going down, so vertically. 
Um, these groups are also called families. Usually when it's the number, they call it a group. And then when they use the name, they call it a family. Um, in groups one, two, and 13 through 18, every group in an atom, or sorry, every atom in a group has the same number of valence electrons. Now we just talked about that with valence electrons and I showed you that pattern. Group one has one valence electron, two has two valence electrons, and so on and so forth. And they're showing you an example here with a uh, beryllium that's in the same group as magnesium. Um, they both have two valence electrons when all is said and done. Very important, those valence electrons are why elements have similar properties within a group, okay? So valence electrons affect the, the way that the atom bonds, okay? So that's why within a group they'll have similar properties. So for example, we're gonna talk about the properties in group one in just a second. Um, so know that the valence electrons are what contributes to the chemical properties of an element and when they have the same number of valence electrons, they have the same chemi chemical properties. Okay, so let's talk about hydrogen for a second. Hydrogen is in group one. However, hydrogen is not part of the family that's in group one. So it's not part of the alkali metals, which we'll talk about in a second. Hydrogen is its own family. So hydrogen is hanging out over there in group one with the alkali metals. Um, it's also hanging out with the metals when it's a non-metal. The reason for this is that hydrogen only has one valence electron. So it fits in that group because that entire group has that one valence electron. So again, hydrogen is its own little thing. Um, it's its own family. It's a very, very reactive gas. Um, there's a video embedded in this. Unfortunately, I can't show it while I'm recording a video. If you'd like to watch it, I'm going to upload the PowerPoint um, of this as well. So it's actually kind of cool. Um, you guys have probably heard of the Hindenburg that happened in like the 1930s. It was a, um, a blimp and it was a passenger blimp. So what happened was hydrogen is a very, very light gas. It's the lightest gas there is. So they used hydrogen to fill the blimp. But for some reason, no one realized that hydrogen was a very reactive gas. So they think that there was just a small bit of static electricity that created a tiny spark and it blew it right up, blew it right out of the air. Crazy thing is that only five out of, I think it was 67 people died, which was miraculous. But um, after that, they stopped using hydrogen for blimps. Instead, they use helium. Helium's a noble gas and helium is very unreactive because its outer shell is full. Still a nice light gas with, that will let things float, but it's not dangerous like hydrogen is. Um, so really all you need to know about hydrogen is that it's its own family, it's a non-metal and that it's really reactive. Uh, okay, next up is the group one alkali metals. Those are right here um, on the periodic table, group one. And they are called, their family name is the alkali metals. So group one, family name, alkali metals. They're the first column on the periodic table, again, doesn't include hydrogen. They are very, very reactive metals because of the fact that they only have one valence electron and they need to get rid of that valence electron to drop down an energy level. So they'll have a full outer shell. They're so, unre or so very reactive and unstable. Um, they are always going to be combined with something else in nature. You're not just going to find... Uh, sodium. Because let's imagine you have a big sodium deposit in the earth. Well, sodium and all of the other group one elements are extremely reactive with water. Um, there is a video again embedded that I can't show you, unfortunately, but when you put sodium in water, it creates a humongous explosion. Um, so imagine you have this big deposit of sodium in the earth. What happens when it rains? Everything's going to explode. So it doesn't occur naturally by itself. Instead, it's combined with something like chlorine. That's sodium chloride. And sodium chloride is something that we need in our bodies. It's salt. 
Uh, we eat it every day and it doesn't kill us. It doesn't explode in our mouths with our saliva. And that's because when it is combined with another element, its properties change. And we'll talk about what chlorine's like by itself in a few minutes too. These are really soft metals. They're soft enough just to cut with a butter knife. Next, we have the group two alkaline earth metals. So I remember the difference between alkali and alkaline earth because group one is alkali, that's one word. Group two is alkaline earth, and that's two words. So we've got group two here. Uh, these are also pretty darn reactive metals. They have two valence electrons that they need to get rid of, so they're not quite as reactive as group one, but they're still pretty reactive, um, and they're always combined with non-metals in nature as well. Uh, several of those elements are important mineral nutrients like magnesium and calcium, good for your bones and your teeth. Um, they're also used a lot in uh, fireworks because they, when they um, drop from a higher to a lower energy level, as we've learned in the lab, they give off light and they give off real pretty colors of light. Next up, we have the D block. Even though they're in different groups, we kind of combine them together into a whole family. And those are the transition metals. There are elements in groups three through 12. Um, those transition metals are less reactive and they're harder metals. They're called transition metals because their number of valence electrons can change. For example, iron can have two valence electrons or it can have four valence electrons. So we don't know it just by looking at it, so they're called transition. Um, those metals uh, include metals that we think of when we think of metals, such as jewelry and construction. We don't usually think of sodium or lithium as metals, but they are. They're in that group one alkaline metals. Um, so those are the metals that are used as metals. And next up we have, next up we have group 17 or 7A. These are the halogens. Halogens are non-metals, and they are very reactive, volatile, which means that they'll react um, all, very well, uh, and they're non-metals. They most uh, commonly make formulas or make, uh, they, uh, sorry, they make uh, compounds with group one because that group has seven valence electrons, so they want to take a valence electron to become stable. Well, who has one to give? That's group one, the alkali metals. So halogens and alkali metals often pair up. Um, they're always found combined in, with another element in nature as well because they're so volatile on their own. These are commonly used as disinfectants and to strengthen your teeth like fluorine. After that, we have group 18 or 8A, the noble gases. Those are very unreactive. They have that full outer shell. They're very stable. Um, they're used in neon signs, used in blimps, like we talked about to fix the Hindenburg problem. They have a full valence shell of eight electrons, except for helium, and this is gonna be super important later on. Helium only has two valence electrons, but its outer shell is full because it's in the first energy level. So here's your helium nucleus, and it only has one energy level. And if we look up here, we know that 1s only goes through s2 so there are only two electrons in it okay so helium only gets two in its outer uh energy level whereas all of the other noble gases will have eight in their outer shell okay so we just talked about the groups or families on the periodic table let's talk about periods periods are our horizontal um lines on the or horizontal elements on the periodic table so going across and i think about it like you have a period at the end of a sentence and the sentence goes horizontally so it kind of makes sense um there are seven periods one two three four five six and seven each element in a period has the same number of energy levels so if you look here at um let's say you have calcium calcium is uh argon and then it's 4s2 3d10 oops my bad sorry it's 4s2 scratch that for a second i was thinking about the next thing so it's 4s2 well vanadium up there is argon so 
here's vanadium. Vanadium is argon and the 4s2 3d3. So its highest energy level is still 4. So if it's in period 4, its highest energy level, although it's not its final energy level, is 4. There are some other groupings to know on the periodic table. You need to know the term representative elements. So representative elements are the group A elements. They are here 1A, 2A, 3A, or 13, 4A, 14, 5A, 6A, 7A, 8A, or 18. Those are called representative elements. Really, that's the S block and the P block. The transition metals are your D block. And then your F block is going to be your actinides and your lanthanides. I don't need you guys to know a ton about those, just what they're called, which should be pretty easy because um, you've got lanthanide as your first um, for F and actinium as your first uh, 5F. So that should help you out there. So do remember the term representative elements and then transition metals and actinides and lanthanides. All right, the periodic table, another pattern on the periodic table, another example of periodicity or periodic law is that the periodic table is also divided up into metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. In red here, we have all of our metals. You can see most of the periodic table is metals. Um, in blue, we have nonmetals, and don't forget old hydrogen over here hanging out. It's still a nonmetal, even though it's over here with the metals. Then along this black line that you guys did on your little periodic table coloring sheet, you have the metalloids. You have boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, um, antimony, and tellurium. Those are metalloids and they have characteristics of both metals and nonmetals, so they don't quite fit, but they're still kind of in the same area, so it still fits a pattern. Physical properties of metals. So let's talk about a few things. And I highlighted what's important here. They're mostly solids at room temperature. The exception is mercury, which is a liquid. Okay. So from your periodic table coloring sheet, you should know the ones that are liquids and the ones that are gases on the periodic table. And then the rest are solids. They are good conductors of heat and electricity. So they let heat and electricity through very easily, which is why you're going to burn yourself if you touch a metal pan. Um, they have high luster. Luster means shiny, so they're shiny in nature. A couple of other vocab words you absolutely need to know. They are ductile. That means it can be stretched into a thin wire like copper. So there's an example of that down here. So copper can be stretched into a thin wire without it breaking. Then we have the word malleable, means, which means it can be pounded into a thin sheet. Well, aluminum is the one we're most um, familiar with that with a tin foil or aluminum foil can be pounded into a thin sheet without breaking. So all metals can, those are just physical properties of them. They also have high melting points. You've got to have a high temperature to melt a metal um, and a high density. They're very dense. It makes sense because they're solids. So the molecules are packed closely together. Let's talk about a chemical property of metals. So chemical properties are different than physical properties. Um, all metals will react with water and or oxygen, and that calls, causes them to corrode or rust. Uh, another example that I don't have a picture of on here is copper. You guys have all seen the Statue of Liberty and it's green color. Well, Statue of Liberty is copper. So when we originally got the Statue of Liberty before she was sitting outside exposed to the air all the time, she was that copper, goldish copper color. So it's the exposure to the air that turned it green. And you'll see that example on pennies. Sometimes you'll see some green and stuff on your older pennies. All right, physical properties of nonmetals. Well, there are in the nonmetal group, 11 of them are gases. There are five solids and there's one liquid. Liquid, um, a liquid nonmetal is bromine. They are dull, not shiny. They are brittle, which means that they break easily. So they're not malleable. They're not ductile. 
they have a low density. Well, we know gases have much lower densities than a solid does because the molecules are all spread out. And of course, a liquid has um, a lower density. The solids in this group have a lower density than the solids in the metal group. For example, sulfur, it's a, it's almost, it's a solid, but it's almost powdery. So like when you kind of touch it, it really crumbles. It's real brittle. They have low boiling points. It's easy to boil them. Um, poor conductors, electricity and heat do not go through them well at all. And again, don't forget, hydrogen is included in this group of nonmetals. Here's a picture of chlorine gas over here. Let's talk about chlorine for a second. Um, so chlorine, we know, combines with sodium. Sodium is that very explosive metal in group one. Well, chlorine is a highly toxic greenish gas. They've used it for um, biological warfare and wars. Uh, basically, it will get into your lungs and burn them. Uh, you'll burn from the inside, and it seems like it's probably a pretty terrible death. So when you have sodium, which explodes when um, in a liquid, and then you have chlorine, which is this crazy toxic gas that would kill you, and you put them together to make salt, which you eat every single day of your life. You intake some salt. It's kind of interesting how the properties change when they combine to make a compound. All right, and the last uh, bit of the periodic table on the stair step line, again, these are your metalloids. And they ex exhibit properties that are in between those of metals and nonmetals. So they're better conductors with not, than nonmetals, but not as good as metals. And they're called semiconductors. I'm sure you guys have heard of semiconductors. Those are used in electronics. Um, for example, silicon, germanium, those are very widely known semiconductors. Uh, silicon is a metalloid. It's an element that's metalloid. And I'm sure you guys have heard of the Silicon Valley out in California, where most of the tech startups happened. Apple and all of those big, huge companies, are, their headquarters were located in the Silicon Valley. And that's named after the element, which is a semiconductor used in all of those computer parts. Some are dull, some are shiny. So again, they're kind of in between metals and nonmetals. All right. All right, guys, here's your lecture quiz. It's going to be due tomorrow morning. That's uh, Tuesday, October 6th by 8.15 a.m. Uh, use the QR code here. You can just use your camera on your phone, most of you, to do the QR code. Um, or you can use this link if you need to. Again, if you want to just link to it, you can go to the PowerPoint um, that's in the module as well. All right, I'll see you guys uh, on Tuesday. Thanks. Bye-bye.